Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word we're going to focus on is from the Gospel, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger or invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison? And did not help you. He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. Sometimes you just hit your breaking point. Sometimes you reach the point when you can't dance around the issue. Someone has to say something about the elephant in the room. You hit the wall, and now you can't just talk about things in generalities or by giving hints. You have to meet this thing head on, and in no uncertain terms, say exactly what is going on. Guys, your wife can only give you so many sideways glances and little hints like, aren't you forgetting something? Before she's just going to explode, it's our anniversary. You forgot, didn't you? Parents, when it's time to have the talk, You can only use so many analogies. You can only call it the birds and the bees for so long before curious minds want to cut right to the chase. Trying to let your high school girlfriend down easy is easier said than done. At some point using phrases like, it's not you, it's me, aren't doing you any favors. Better to just get to the point and get things off your chest. You kind of get the sense that that's what Jesus is doing here. He spends all of Matthew 25 sharing these stories that explain how his return to earth someday is going to look. He uses that beautiful picture of a groom coming back to take his beloved bride back home with him and says, you are either ready for me to come back or you're not, so keep watch. Then he tells a story about a master who left for a really long time and entrusted his wealth to three servants who were supposed to use those gifts to grow and advance his kingdom. And the point there is that we are supposed to serve for the good of the master. Put your gifts to work for the Lord. Just in case the disciples and anyone else listening were still sort of, you know, scratching their heads and wondering what in the world Jesus kept going on and on about. There's this one last story he uses to explain what things will be like. And if you get the feeling that this one has fewer pictures, there's less beating around the bush, I don't think you're alone. This last one is less of a story and more laying out the facts. There's no mistaking what he's talking about, no misinterpreting who's who, no questions afterwards. Jesus cuts right to the chase. And the picture he burns into our minds is of his return, not like a bridegroom, not like a long gone master coming back to check on his portfolio. He's coming back like the king he is, glorious, righteous, and powerful. I mean, there's going to be an army of angels following on his heels. And every person on the planet is going to see this happening. Jesus makes sure there's no room for misunderstanding with this one. Because he wants everyone to understand the seriousness 
of what he's talking about and how black and white things will be. Because the reason Jesus is coming is to separate. And whenever you are separating things, you have to have some kind of standard. Whites and darks for laundry, by color or season, if it sparks joy or doesn't for all of you Marie Kondo fans. When we have the rummage sale at church, we have to sort through all of the clothes, especially the baby stuff, and organize them by size and gender. You need to be able to read to separate by size. You need some very basic cultural awareness to separate clothing by gender. If you don't have that, you can't make the separation. You can make it, but it just won't make any sense. So you, or you just won't separate. People misunderstand the implications of differences all the time. The gender mess we are in right now is due to people misunderstanding why the difference between male and female matters. Racial tensions often have to do with blaming something natural for something that is entirely nurtured. People misunderstand the implications of differences all the time. And so sometimes we stop ourselves from making those distinctions and separations just to save us the headache of trying to justify our standard of separation. But the sheep and the goats are different in some very distinct ways. They're not completely different, not in every way. I mean, if we were comparing and separating six-legged creatures and four-legged creatures, then they would be exactly the same. But here, they are different in some way. King Jesus makes his separation between the sheep and the goats based on that distinct difference. And it becomes very clear he isn't talking about livestock anymore. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. On his right are the sheep, the ones blessed by the Father, who have always been bound for heaven. Always? When I was in grade school, we did a big production every two years, and when I was 12, this musical was going to be, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, and I wanted to be Snoopy more than anything. So I practiced and practiced so I would be ready to nail my audition. And I did, and I got the part. Only later did I find out that I was the only person who really tried out for that part. So it didn't matter how good I was or wasn't, I kind of got that part by default. Now, I didn't have much of an ego about anything at 12, even after landing a starring role in our school's musical. But when we look at how God does things, how he separates the sheep from the goats, it's definitely ego-shattering. If the kingdom was prepared for us since the creation of the world, then I didn't earn it. And human nature wants to earn. Human nature wants the reason we were pulled from the crowd is that we stood out in some stellar, impossible-to-miss way. We don't always want to, to work or give effort, but we want what we have to be owed to us rather than a gift to us. And there's a word for feeling that way. Entitlement. And calling someone entitled isn't generally viewed as a compliment. But we are so entitled. That's why Jesus' standard by which he separates us is so upsetting at first blush. We don't earn heaven because we stood out. You didn't show yourself as a sheep sticking out in a crowd of goats. Even the word inheritance describes a gift, not an entitled reward earned through obligation. And that sense of entitlement is easy to understand when you get things mixed up. When you put the cart before the horse or the chicken before the egg, it's easy to get turned around on why things are the way that they are. So when you get focused on what people did or, or didn't do, what you've done or haven't done, then that entitled attitude and need to feed your ego, they're going to come through. But you look closer at this story and see that when Jesus comes back, the first thing he is going to do is separate. And he's going to do it according to his standard. There's no mention of works or attitudes or anything like that, just separation. Hopefully we can understand why it's so critical and comforting that Jesus says it's going to be that way. What we are not asked to do is something we cannot do. And how do we know that? Because we were asked to do it, but couldn't. Adam and Eve had one law, and they broke it, and their sinful DNA is in you and me. So we don't do any better. And if that wasn't evidence enough for humanity, God gave his law to Israel to show them how lost they really were, because they couldn't follow it. So someone else was going to have to do it in their place. 
So instead of whining that heaven is a gift and not a debt that we can somehow pay back if we try hard enough, we should be thanking God for his compassion. He made sure that heaven was earned, just not by you and me. That was not going to happen through the efforts of sinners, so he sent his son, Jesus. Through his innocence, God can judge you not guilty. Now, I know you're jumping up and down at home, yelling at the screen, because there's clearly a connection between the good things people did and where they ended up in this story. But imagine you have two people, both live in the same upscale neighborhood, they both drive a $100,000 car and eat at the best, most expensive places in town. They wear the the nicest clothes, right? They're rich, right? Maybe. But what if one of them is getting foreclosure notices and has a half dozen credit cards maxed out and still owes $60,000 on the car? Being rich means you have money. It, It shows itself in different ways, but don't mistake evidence for essence. Don't confuse trappings with the truth. When Jesus describes what the righteous do with their lives, that's not the essence of their righteousness, but the evidence. And look who asked for the evidence. It's not the judge. It's the defendants. The judge says, not guilty, and the defendants say, on what grounds? God says, because I justified you myself, but the behavior that you show in your lifetime, that's how you know that you're justified. And that's how others know, because that's how justified people act. The reaction is mild shock, too, because their king doesn't point to all the grand gestures they had made during their lives. He doesn't call everyone forward and share the greatest good deed they ever did in their entire lives. He simply says, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That just emphasizes even more how it wasn't about the things that they did. These things were just little pieces of evidence that show that they had saving faith in Jesus. These things just happened. Their connection to Jesus made them happen. Then in verse 41, we hear what happens to those who don't have that connection that leads to evidence in their lives. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 41 may not be the exact parallel opposite you would expect. Remember that the kingdom was prepared for us before the creation of the world. But Jesus will not say to those on his left that no kingdom was prepared for them. In fact, he says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. If you read your Bible carefully, and you'll see it doesn't leave any room for universalism, the idea that everyone will go to heaven no matter what they believe or put their trust in. But it also has no room for a God who is anything but loving and gracious. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. His will is that all be saved. But those who are not saved have no one to blame but themselves. The fact is, they are not righteous because they have rejected Jesus. And he will point out that even the evidence testifies against them. But the thing that keeps drawing our attention today is who's sitting on that throne. Jesus told this story to show everyone what they can expect on the last day when he's going to come back to judge the earth. He didn't share it so that we could pat ourselves on the back and talk about what makes us special and what separates us from the pack. No. People don't want to hear how great you are, and they don't need to hear that. They need to hear how great Jesus is. They need to hear about the king so they can get ready for him to come back. We all have shortcomings, but... We can look forward to Jesus' judgment knowing that being outnumbered in this life doesn't matter. Being harassed and persecuted in this life doesn't matter. Even your shortcomings and failures don't matter. You're going to eternal life. So when you make your judgments, the standard for everyone is Jesus. Show people with your words and actions that Jesus is victorious and his standards of separation are good for his people. Because they are all about him, our King, and our God. Amen. And now this piece of understanding that goes beyond, and this piece that goes beyond all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.